Hi, I'm Jonathan Charles, and this is Pocket Dilemmas, the podcast where we deal with political and economic questions that make your world spin. You can't see them, you can't smell them, but today they run our world. But should they? What are they? Wait to find out. What are Pocket Dilemmas? Are algorithms biased? Will robots take away your job? Do you trust cryptocurrencies? How do we bridge the pay gap? What is the future of poverty? This is Dilemmas at EBRD.com. Well, today's Dilemma is brought to us in our London improvised studio by my very lively colleague, Kerry Law. Kerry, I've been hinting about what we're going to talk about. Tell us. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, so the dilemma that I've really been struggling with lately is, you know, algorithms are everywhere. Uh, They really seem to run our world, but should they? Well, that's a very interesting uh, subject. Uh, How did you come up with that? Well, here at the bank, I've been heavily involved in our year-long research series. It's called the Megatrend Series, and we dove into the topic of the future of work. You know, we looked at things like automation and how it'll affect our countries of operation, as well as reskilling to kind of stay ahead of AI. But the one thing we really didn't touch on was algorithms. They are everywhere. And a lot of people don't know that we're interfacing with them every day. Um, So, you know, it was just about the subject of algorithms, but also the ethical implications implications of them in our day-to-day lives. Now, Kerry, I'm a very old bloke, so you're going to have to unpack this for me. Um, Should algorithms rule the world? You know, what, what does that really mean? First, let's really establish what an algorithm is. Um, so there is a clip from BBC Bite Size explaining kids aged five to seven. So that's, Jonathan, good, that's good for me. That's good. I like that. <laughs> exactly. So you should be able to understand. Um, but, you know, it's it's a short a short clip and it's actually quite simple. So let's let's roll it. If we want a computer to understand how to do something, we need to give it an algorithm. Pick up, brush. Algorithm sounds like a big word, doesn't it? But actually, an algorithm is something very simple, but important. Pick up, toothbrush. An algorithm is a list of steps you give to computers to solve a problem or get something done. Oh, okay. I think I might have understood that. So, in effect, algorithms are computer programs that allow us to do a variety of tasks and replace humans in, you know, when humans would have been doing them manually in the past. Exactly. It's just a set of inputs that produce some outputs based on a given set of rules, um, either kind of defined or learned. So, quite simple. Oh, quite simple. Yes, I like that. So um, the question that we're asking, should algorithms rule the world? Now, we've got a couple of guests to help us answer that as well. There's Johnny Penn, who is a Google Technology Policy Fellow, an AI researcher at the uh, University of Cambridge, and Dawn Dahani, a Data Partnerships Manager at the Wellcome Trust. Oh, and Jonathan, I should mention, Dawn is actually on the line with us all the way from Barbados. Uh, Let us know, both of you then, give us five-second burst on what you think about this. In five seconds. Um... I think that the questions that we're uh, confronting here are a- actually age old. Uh, and the, the interesting future we have uh, laying ahead of us is determining how to do old things with new technology. And Dawn, what's your burst? Yes, so I think we're at a crucial point now where we could choose various different futures in terms of how algorithms are integrated in our world. And I think it's up to all of us to choose the best one for citizens and the population. Okay, good or bad, we're going to be unpacking that story in the next few minutes. And you know, Kerry, even our jobs here can be automated. I know. You know, I actually took this quiz. OECD put out a quiz a few weeks ago, and it it um, tests you on whether an algorithm can take your job. They can definitely take my job. Oh, it's gosh. Well, um, well, it looks like at least what I do in, in the strategy unit at, at the EBRD is, uh, is, isn't as automatable as... As I, uh, as people would maybe think, um, and I was very low for for getting for getting my job replaced by an algorithm. But you should definitely take the test, everyone. It's on OECD. Just Google OECD. Maybe algorithm take my job, and and you'll find that test. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that. Actually, I'm going to take heart as well from that Bruce Springsteen song, "The Human Touch." Let's hope we still need the human touch. Uh, what do people actually know about algorithms? Well, our producers Olga and Olivia have been across the bank to find out. Do I know how algorithms are used? Sort of, maybe in relation to Facebook and Twitter and Google. To spy on people? (laughs) No, I know nothing about algorithms and governments. (laughs) There's pros and cons. Obviously, you can get some very good pictures of what's going on, but you also then have to be careful that there isn't some kind of inbuilt flaw in the algorithm. I think as long as uh, this whole process is regulated in a way, I think, yes, it would be a very useful tool for, for governments to use. 
Okay, so, you know, it's a really intimidating word, algorithm. It sounds like you really need to be a mathematician to understand it. But really, we interface with them everywhere, you know, whether you're scrolling through your news feed or you're applying for a job. There are also some other kind of more interesting cases where we use algorithms, like countries using them to disperse refugees. Uh, here we have actually a clip from Kirk Bansack from Immigration Policy Lab at Stanford, and he explains how he's been working on an algorithm to do just that. We find that a refugee's destination plays a really important role in their ability to achieve economic self-sufficiency, namely in the form of early employment. And we find actually that destination matters in two ways. So first, certain locations may have better labor markets, and that may make it easier for refugees in general to find jobs. But in addition to that, we also find that certain places are better for certain types of refugees, depending on their own personal characteristics, such as their language skills, or their age, or gender, or their ethnic networks. So in other words, there appear to be synergies between refugee characteristics and resettlement locations, which means that we should be able to increase the average employment rate among refugees by better matching them to the places that best fit their own profiles. Okay, so we've got Johnny Penn here. Uh, Johnny, you know, we heard an example there of something that seems to work. Is it really that simple that if you develop this algorithm, you just let it do its job? I think, unfortunately, we're finding that these algorithms can be more biased than humans at times. And that's important to remember because the way that these systems work is that they derive a pattern from data. So if I were to task an algorithm, let's say, to, to determine how much uh, a new employee, let's say a woman, would be paid in, a, in an office, in the world that we live in today, women are paid lower because of systematic bias. But to the algorithm, looking at a data set, it would think, oh, it's, it's, it, the phenomenon is that women are paid lower for a reason that it doesn't understand. And so if you accept that as the new rule going forward, you're actually baking bias back in to the process. So when I joked just a minute ago about the Bruce Springsteen title track, uh, The Human Touch, right. that's where humans come in, is it to correct biases of algorithms? My position on this is that as we enter a future in which we can have large-scale automated systems, we need to recognize where we want them and where we don't. So I'll give you an example. In Canada now, uh, I'm Canadian, the, the government offered to have drone surveillance above forests. So if you wanted to go for a walk and you got lost, the drone could help you. The Canadian public said, we don't want this. The reason we go to the, the forest is to, to, to get lost. We don't necessarily want this, uh, this added surveillance. And I think as we have you know, al new algorithmic systems that we're implementing in different places, part of that conversation is, do we want this to begin with? Is this the absolute best way uh, to derive the sort of uh, knowledge that we're looking for? There's a case that I was reading about, and I'm sure it's, it's really well known, so you probably know about it. Algorithms, obviously, in cases like surveillance, like you just mentioned, can be quite scary. However, what about in cases where, you know, humans are really noisy and an algorithm would kind of correct this, no? It comes down to, in the algorithmic world, there's two ways to have power. You can choose what you're optimizing for, what the metrics are, or you can choose what not to measure. But to the first point, around crime and the use of algorithmic justice, let's say, or using algorithms to help a judge decide on whether someone should be you know, allowed to go free or something. The question is, is this the best use of this technology? Because what activists in the U.S. say, for example, is that rather than using machine learning to kind of sharpen the tools that we have to identify who's a criminal and who's not, why don't we uh, try, try to use it to identify why crime happens? Is it to alleviate crime or is it to fix crime? Um, and I, I, in this case, would vote that the first is, is a better use. Very interesting. You know, and you did, you did write an, an article for The Economist in, in November, uh, and it was titled, AI Thinks Like a Corporation, and That's Worrying. Um, and you explain kind of why that's worrying. But I was wondering, you know, you, you also refer to Kathy O'Neill's book, we Weapons of, of Math Destruction, and how algorithms can undermine kind of the basic um, democratic mechanisms and, and, pr and principles that we're used to today. Can you kind of, you know, expand on that a little bit? The legal system that we have is based off of, you know, explainability and, and accountability. That it's the legal system is, is organic. It's it's not fixed as some people might think pre getting into the legal system. You know, it's 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 constantly evolving, but it's constantly evolving off of our ability to interrogate uh, you know, certain situations that machine learning algorithms don't always allow us to interrogate. So if you have, as you mentioned before, a black box algorithm, what that means is that the logic used to find a certain pattern, to drive a certain pattern, is obtuse to us. Um, so I was just in Montreal at, the, at an event called Neurops, which is the major AI, technical AI conference every year. And the team I was working with there are rethinking the foundations of biology. 
And the, the, the simple way to describe it is that the way we've built uh, uh, our understanding of the biological world right now is very much off, based off of the way that we think. But if you start using neural networks and they start to find patterns that t seem kind of alien to us at first, you end up with almost a different branch of science that we couldn't explain to each other as kind of coherently as we describe biology. How, how do we control that then? If we can't really, uh, in effect, the, the AI is taking on a mind of its own. Yeah and going down a road of its own, how do we as humans, in the way that we think, how are we going to keep control of that? So it's, it's choosing where to use it, I think. And this is kind of Kathy O'Neill's point, is if you, if you launch these obtuse systems into something as, 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 as you know, value-sensitive as the criminal justice system, is that fair to or is that a fair thing to do to one another? What happens if they get smarter than us, though? Because in the end, they're learning too. I, I take issue with, this is a popular argument, and I... I it's the they part. It's, it's just math. <laughs> you know, we as a species have a tendency to want to anthropomorphize these systems because they're complex and we want to relate to them. And that's why if you read about AI in the paper, you see an, uh, an image of the Terminator or, or Frankenstein, you know, digitized or something um, or roboticized. If you look at the history of this field, and we were talking about this on the way in here, actually, uh, computing emerged in public administration. You know, in this country, actually, it's the British civil service that paid for the first uh, mechanical computers over 200 years and developed them to help us tabulate census data and things like that. And the first prototype of artificial intelligence was derived off of man out of management science. It was how you manage a corporation. The, the, the same mathematics were used to model uh, what we described as intelligent behavior in a machine. And so this field has a long history in the way that we manage each other's behavior. And to answer your question, as we enter this new era of artificial intelligence with te techniques that are difficult to unpack, let's say, we have to choose what the right places to use. We have to basically evolve our legal system to some extent, but also rely on the legal system we fought very hard to get to choose uh, where to use, uh, where we, we, we want to use these systems. So, you know, I guess when we're looking at where to use these, where to use these systems and in, in what processes we should kind of implement these algorithms, when it comes to ethics, you know, whose ethics are they? And when data scientists kind of program these algorithms, I guess they are inherently using their own ethics to then kind of bake into this, to this algorithm. Um, how, do you, how do you unpack that and how do you kind of sort through, through those, that, that minefield of, of issues? Great question. So the field of AI ethics is booming right now. Um, Microsoft has invested a lot of money internally to, to hire ethicists and evaluate their techniques. Lots of big companies are doing this. Major research labs are looking at this question. And in my view... The trouble with AI ethics is that ethics means something different to everybody. And it, it, without a system of accountability, it can, it can quickly become a kind of what people are calling ethics washing, where you're just projecting the image of being kind of accountable or good, but without having any, you know, uh, without having signed anything to say you will. So I think that the, the better solution for the kind of ethical problems involved is to start talking about AI and human rights. This is increasingly becoming an area that people are starting to look at, is how can we use artificial intelligence to, to accomplish this, the SDGs? Just very quickly before we move on, uh, obviously the dilemma, Kerry's dilemma, should algorithms rule the world, just very directly, what would be your direct answer to Kerry's dilemma? Um, I don't think algorithms do rule the world. I think humans rule the world. And when we talk about algorithms, we perpetuate a mythology that seem, that takes agency away from the human actors involved. But it's someone's behind, someone is pressing go on each of these machines. And even if the machine is able to take uh, decisions for itself, the same way that, say, a corporation is, that corporation, that algorithm is still owned and operated by somebody. So we're attempting to resolve the dilemma. Should algorithms rule the world? And with us today are Johnny Penn and Dawn Dehani. Dawn Dehani, Data Partnerships Manager at the Wellcome Trust, formerly of the UK government and the Open Data Institute. You know about all things uh, data-wise, uh, Dawn. What's your take? You've been listening to this discussion. So I think for me, what's really important is culture. So I think particularly when we're talking about um, AI algorithms and government, um, as well as big corporations, I feel as though at the moment there's a culture of a move fast and break things, there's disruptive culture um, in these organisations. And instead, we need to take the time to um, assess the implications of each decision um, that we're making. So 
I feel as though we talk a lot about black box algorithms and as if it's one very smart data scientist somewhere optimizing um, a machine learning algorithm. But actually, this individual is making lots of small decisions along the way before they deploy that algorithm. So I really think we need to slow this process down. We need to involve more social scientists, user researchers um, in the process to begin to scrutinize, um, scrutinize the way in which we're using algorithms. You know, I, I think that you bring up a really good point. I think this translation between uh, data scientists and policymakers um, and also the data collectors, frankly, is something that we really just don't talk about. You know, so I guess in your experience with government, what do you think the key ethical challenge are, challenges are of using algorithms in government? I think actually the challenges are very similar to the private sector. It's just that in government, the um, you know, we're dealing with, with people's lives in, in a completely different way. So... I feel as though in government we're serving the public here, so we need to work out who are these algorithms for. Are they for? Are they, are they to improve public services, uh, to improve um, how the public interacts with government, to keep people safe, or are we um, building algorithms for a different type of future? And I think what's really important is that we we continue to have conversations about this. And um, for instance, there's one example which is really brilliant from when I worked in government, was actually in Essex, um, which is a council in the UK. And they were using um, data science algorithms and AI to actually predict school readiness and child poverty. And they did, the way in which they went about it is similar to other organisations. So they looked at different data sets that they had from the police, from youth offending, social care stats. Um, They built an algorithm And they were able to identify, let's say, 500 high risk households, Um, half of them were not they were not aware of before. And what's really important, I think what's also good about that example is that they were very open about what they were doing. So the, the data scientists, the people who were developing the algorithms were working with the social scientists and people who were thinking about ethics to ensure that what they were building um, was fair, it was open, and um, it was a way to create an intervention to help those households instead of, um, you know, persecute people. No, that, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I think that's an interesting example of positive use of algorithms. Uh, other examples I can think of as well are in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, where algorithms are being used, for example, on various medical treatments. I guess that shows the demand is huge. And, you know, can we really try to restrain that demand whilst we're attempting to, to work out all the ethics that go around it? I think that we, we will have to rein it in slightly. But also, in terms of the teams that are building these algorithms, they need to be a lot more diverse. So um, I work in the the AI ethics and data science sector, and I definitely see a divide. So often, in my experience, the technologists are male, um, they're white, and they're building these algorithms. But all of the people who are talking about the ethics are are kind of slightly separate. There's like a group of social scientists talking about uh, about ethics that are separate and more diverse. So I feel as though we need to improve the pipeline of people who are getting into this field. And not only in terms of diversity, in terms of gender and race, but in the types of people that are involved in creating these algorithms. So we need to have social scientists, user researchers, people who are whose job it is to think about long term the long term implement um, implications of technology, actually involved in the creation of these algorithms, not just um, kind of data scientists and machine learning experts. I should explain, by the way, Dawn, you're not here with us in the studio because I can hear wonderful parrots or birds tweeting in the background. Oh, uh, sorry it? about that. I can't control that. Sorry, I'm in Barbados. <laughs> We're not complaining. It <laughs> makes me wonder where I'd like to be on a cold day in London. So, you know, I, I think you bring up some really interesting points. Um, you know, so where where should humans really be interacting with these algorithms? And I guess to to really uh, underscore, to really get to the heart of what you're talking about with the div- with the diversity of the people creating these algorithms, you know, do you think this is just a fundamental issue that we have in our education system, that we need to start educating more women and, and girls to kind of be a little bit more, uh, you know, literate when it comes to technology? Or why, why do you think that we really lack this diversity in the creation of these algorithms? Yeah, so... Um I think it's twofold. I, I, I do believe there is a pipeline problem, but I think that's probably overestimated. So in the UK, I'm part of loads of different networks of women and UK black tech, Ada's List, lots of different organisations where there are brilliant women and people of colour who are working in the data science space. But I don't think their voices are amplified enough. Um, 
I also think it's about the culture of different organisations that are creating these algorithms. People need to feel as though they're in a space where they can speak up if they feel as though um, work is unethical, and that often is not the case. So it's a few different things. It's the pipeline, it's raising the um, the voices of people of colour and women who are currently working in this space, and it's also creating an environment in um, where these algorithms are being created where people feel as though they can speak up and challenge. So where do you hope we'll get to in the end, Dawn? Is it the idea of some perfect sort of data-driven civil servant fulfilling the needs of, of individuals? Well, I, I am a massive data nerd, <laughs> but... <laughs> it's the parrots but, that do it. <laughs> yeah, it's the parrots, yeah. But I do think that um, that it's, it's, it's the human involvement. It's how humans interact with this technology. And I think, as Johnny was saying, um, we, I think we're in a culture where everyone's kind of worshipping the algorithm, but we need to remember that it is humans are making these decisions. So we need to make sure the humans that are making the decisions are held accountable and are given the tools to um, be less biased. Okay, Johnny, it's your chance to jump in here. I would say that, you know, when people talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about removing bias. And the the truth is you can't remove bias. Life is bias. Each of us has a personal, you know, view of this world and that politics is how we share that view. And so uh, be wary of of (laughs) vendors that come to you and say, we're going to solve your bias problems. I think of, you know, the difference with some of these systems that, 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 you know, as opposed to th- it being an algorithm that just kind of exacts a series of rules, is that, how do you describe this? Sorry. Um, machine learning systems, one way to think about these things is you're not designing an artifact, you're designing a relationship. Because they iterate and they learn and they respond to your behavior. So it's not necessarily like a chair that you sit in that will always be a certain shape, but it's something that as more data is added to it, as the model is refined, it will learn. You know, that's why Alexa in talking to you might learn your voice and respond to you more effectively over time. And so in the development community, I think as we deploy these large systems and we use big data systems to drive, you know, insights about how you might want to change a community, it's critical to to think, okay, what's the bias in the system now? What should we anticipate as a potential problem? Maybe there aren't, uh, there aren't enough, uh, you know, diverse voices in designing the system we've had. That's a great point. I agree with Don. Um, how can we rethink as we reiterate and redeploy, you know, other systems or other kind of um, vectors that we can pull into this. Dawn, caveat emptor seems to be the message from Johnny. Buy beware, proceed with caution. Yes, you can try and uh, make sure there's more diversity in the organization of these things and the people who are engaged in uh, in setting up the algorithms, but caveat emptor. I, I think maybe we've reached a bit of consensus there because... <laughs> I'm sorry to because, hear that. <laughs> no, um... Because I, I do agree. I think um, it's it's not. This isn't something that can be solved with a silver bullet. Um, and I'm so. What I'm happy about is that there's so much conversation about the way in which algorithms are embedded in in our daily interactions. Because I think I think the first step is making the public aware of when an algorithm is presenting something to them or making a decision based on, the, on them. And I think more openness is needed in terms of um, when algorithms are being used how they are making decisions in order for us to um, to make sure they're deployed ethically and sensibly. So people have been looking for a metaphor to describe what machine learning and algorithm and, and artificial intelligence are. <laughs> and one that I really like is they're like salt. Artificial intelligence is like salt. You can add it to things and in proportion it might be really, you know, it might create a nice result. But if you add too much, it will become unhealthy. But another metaphor that I also like is that artificial intelligence is a bit like a mirror because it forces us to look back at ourselves, to reflect or to see what we, uh, what behaviors we see in our, you know, quantified behavior and think about how that may want us to change the world. So to go back to women and gender, for example, there's a big push right now to, to recruit more women into the field of, into STEM and into, you know, uh, STEM fields and computer science, let's say. And we forget that actually, especially in this country and in the UK, women were the first computers. Women, you know, this field was born by women's hands. And women, and this is a history that's been tracked really well by a historian named Mar Hicks, has shown that women were actually 
systematically pushed out of the field as it became more high status because men thought, oh, I li- you know, I, this is a field I want to participate in. And it cost the UK its lead, its, its, its lead globally in computing to, to not lean on this, this expert knowledge that we actually had. And so moving forward, I think we need, to, we need to think very broadly about the society we want. As things change, we have to think about our values and how can we see technology as a means and not an end? How do we express our values through these systems and not uh, entrench ourselves in the sort of systemic biases against women, for example, that we know exist and we know will get worse if we don't start to think more broadly. All right, Johnny, thank you very much indeed. Dawn, thank you as well. Thank you to the parrots, by the way, beautiful chorus in the background. (laughs) Uh, Kerry, an awful lot of information there. So have we helped you to resolve your dilemma? And the reminder, of course, of the dilemma, should algorithms rule the world? You know, should we imperfect humans remain in charge? Can we, can they rule the world and we imperfect humans remain in charge? So, you know, it it seems like algorithms are pervasive, but um, as Johnny said, you know, humans rule the world, and I actually love that. And maybe even, in particular, women rule the world. Um, (laughs) Actually, I agree with you. (laughs) So, you know, I I guess I've learned a a few things from this conversation that I want to take back and I think really take to heart. So we've learned that biases are everywhere, so we can't really expect an algorithm to necessarily be perfect. However, you know, we really need to strive and keep in mind that, you know, ethics and and these biases are really important. Um, and they're really important because technology really amplifies these biases. So as we start to work on these algorithms and implement them into government, I think we really need to focus on uh, making sure that we have the ethics and the biases in mind from the very start. I'll tell you one of my takeaways, actually, Kerry, is that, you know, it's very clear, isn't it? We have to get to grips with this because this is an unstoppable momentum. Algorithms are here. They are going to be here, even more so present in our lives. Uh, that's very clear from the sort of conversations we've been having today. And therefore, this is a question which is increasingly going to be very relevant. We cannot escape this question. Exactly. You know, the, the pace of change is is faster than we've ever seen in our history. And so we kind of just need to get on board and we need to make sure that this doesn't get ahead of us, which maybe there's a policy response here where policymakers probably need to um, start funding some of these, some of the research to to look at how to control AI and more research into scrutinizing AI. You know, I think that there's there's a lot of pull today to get the research uh, going and, fu- and funded about, you know, how we can make AI better and faster and stronger, but where's the research to really try to figure out how to control it and, and how to measure it? And I think that's, that's probably the policy response I, I take away today. All right. Well, that is it from us. We'll be back with a new dilemma in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much to our guests. Thank you to you, Kerry, as well. Goodbye. This podcast was brought to you by the EBRD. We'll be back soon with a new episode. In the meantime, send us your feedback, suggestions and ideas on dilemmas at ebrd.com. And remember, reviewing and rating us helps others to find us. Until next time.